Hello, hello. I was reading a phenomenal article by Cecilia de Anastasio on the history of Twitch, where it's going, what's happening to it, and its future. And I had to make this video because I think I have some information on this subject that probably nobody else has. And I really want to talk, talk about this. If you're interested in Twitch as a platform from a marketing perspective, maybe a content creation perspective, maybe you've streamed there or thought about streaming there, or maybe just like to watch it, this is the video for you. And I'm Devin Nash. I run a creative agency called Novo that represents brands and influencers across multiple platforms. And this channel is a show about attention, marketing, and kind of how those forces drive the new media world. I want to talk about this because I'm an OG on Twitch. I started streaming on Twitch in 2012, became a partner around the same time, and I went all the way to 2015 streaming live full-time playing a game called League of Legends, which we all know and love. And then I stopped to segue into esports, um, started, r r helped run a company called Team Dignitas, then a company called Counterlogic Gaming. And then I went back to streaming full-time actually in like 2019-ish after we sold. And I did that up until 2020, 2021-ish, where I started posting some videos, why I'm losing faith in Twitch posted a year ago, and why I lost faith in Twitch posted seven months ago. So you can kind of see that my sort of gradual descent, but through that time, I've actually represented Twitch on several different levels, both as an agency uh, with the agency that I ran aforementioned and any uh, sports, we had contracts with Twitch. So I've been super deep in Twitch for a long time um, and talked to, to everyone in the executive level. And I think it can hopefully provide a lot of context into this. I don't like to talk about myself that much in the beginning of videos, but I had to just to kind of provide some context into why, uh, how, like now you kind of know how I'm going to talk about this and, and, and where I can hopefully provide value. And I think this is going to reveal a lot about the direction of Twitch and where it's going. Um, so let's start. So Twitch, the popular website where people go to watch other people play games, has lost six top employees at the beginning of the year, including the chief operating officer, that's Sarah Clemens, and the chief content officer, that's Aragorn, and the head of creator development. The exodus began last year. More than 300 employees left, and so far, 60-plus people have walked out the door in 2022. That's a pretty incredible number, and when you lose that much of your executive staff, something is really going on, right? Like, at a company that large, if that is happening, that's pretty crazy. We're going to get into all that. The departures will probably continue, if not accelerate, said a, uh, seven current and former employees because they said Twitch is losing touch with his North Star, a community of streamers whose gaming exploits average uh, 140 million people to the platform every month. Okay, so, uh, and then I just want to talk about uh, what uh, this next part before I kind of get into it. So Marcus, who, by the way, is a phenomenal person. Marcus, also known as DJ Weed, is one of the OG, OGest people of Twitch, and he is the head of creator development mentioned here. And he left Twitch just pretty recently um, and said he faults Twitch approach to becoming a mainstream service, saying that it hired outsiders uninterested in business and culture. Um, we went the Silicon Valley route, unwilling to learn what the community was and why it was special. The customer was the content creator. If you're not passionate about the product, you're not really looking at the customer's lens. I think Marcus has uh, incredible insight into Twitch, and I think he's absolutely right here. What? So, so Twitch, uh, let's, let's uh, start doing a little bit of background on Twitch. Okay. So Twitch in about 2011 was actually a website called Justin TV. Might've been a little bit earlier than that, because I think I'm just going by the time I streamed could have been like 2009 or so. Justin TV was a website that streamed all sorts of stuff. This is like way before copyright. And like the internet was like pretty, uh, new in terms of like the new media world and live streaming. Like nobody was looking at live streaming. You could stream whatever you wanted. I mean like whatever you wanted. Right. So Justin TV had like soccer games, like sports games, NFL stuff. Um, people, I remember one of the former employees of Justin TV, like lit a chair on fire and peed it out on stream. I mean, it was a crazy place. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, Justin TV was started by like a guy who wanted to document his life through live streaming and walking around. And, uh, that guy, Justin Khan now makes fant fantastic videos. And that anyway, Justin uh, TV actually became Twitch because Twitch was to be the kind of gaming focus uh, sort of website that Justin TV couldn't do because it was so general. So Twitch became the brand name for a live streaming service that was video game focused. And I want to I'm highlighting that because I want to say that I think that that is the most important one of the most important takeaways that we're going to talk about here. What Twitch excelled at was being a niche website for gaming. And gamers flocked to Twitch because they didn't have a community. It sounds so weird to say. Now, like in 2022, when gaming is this like really mainstream thing that's super well accepted, but in 
2012, uh, gaming wasn't as cool. And like before that, it wasn't as cool. You get made fun of in high school for being a gamer, you know? And now like kids are on Fortnite and everything like at eight years old. Like it, it's a wildly different ecosystem. And people were searching for a platform or a place they could hang out that was going to make them feel like they belong somewhere in a, in a group of like-minded people. So Twitch became that platform. And, and simultaneously, there were also platforms that were built in real life, like PAX, if you, uh, uh, PAX events. And uh, gaming events became incredibly successful because people wanted to find a place where other people of like-minded um, uh, like mindedness were there. And Twitch was so good at this. Like the community, even from the get go, was a hyper focused gaming community that really focused on community. And that's what Marcus is saying here. And, and, and when Cecilia writes the North Star of a community of gamers, that is really what the core of Twitch was. And that uh, persisted all the way through, I think, to the point of Amazon's acquisition. And the people that were running Twitch at the time, notably Kevin Lin, who was the previous COO, um, John Howell, who was the head of partnerships at the time, who is not really mentioned. He departed Twitch some years ago. It was a massive, massive part of building the platform. And then from a technological uh, perspective, um, there was a a guy named John. I'm not sure he'd want to be fully named, who was a, a huge part of the uh, sort of building of the structure. But the alignment of Twitch was we are a gaming platform. And we are going to focus on gaming and gamers, and we're going to put them together. And then we're going to, and then best of all that, we're going to give gamers an avenue, a venue to actually make money doing what they love. Like, holy, that is crazy. That the concept that like I played video games all my life, right from 1999 when I loaded into EverQuest One, my what quite possibly my favorite game of all time and on, on a 56k modem that i was stealing from my dad right like i literally have loved gaming so passionately so much and to find a place where not only other people are there to talk about that stuff but also to actually make money off of it incredible right that's the dream and that's the dream that twitch sold and it's why it became such a, a, a huge success so what happened <laughs> right like why are we at this point and like why do i have to to keep making videos like this? Why did people like um, Sarah Clemens and Aragorn, uh, who even by my standards are um, kind of the later crew, right? Compared to the people that originally left, like we talk about Kevin Lin and stuff like that. What actually happened? Well, Amazon bought the company, right? And I'm going to start, here's where we're going to start talking about uh, some of the stuff that I think a lot of people don't know that I'll provide context into. So so Twitch at the time had the decision between two companies. They could have been bought by Google for actually slightly more. I think the offer was like 1.2 to 1.3 billion. And the offer from Amazon was around 900 million. But Twitch felt better aligned with Amazon because they felt that Google might just absorb Twitch into YouTube and then the culture would be lost. Now, that's kind of ironic. <laughs> Because what ended up happening was the culture was sort of lost through Amazon anyway. And to some extent, that's inevitable of merger and acquisitions, but I think um, happened in, in, a, in a particular way with the way that Amazon took the direction of the company eventually. So um, throughout this entire process, we, we won't be able to paint a really good picture of what's happening without someone who's mentioned in this article, Emmett Shear. So Emmett Shear, who's currently CEO as of the time of this recording, uh, I say that because I, I can't imagine he will be for very long, uh, but it has maintained and been CEO since Justin Kahn and uh, Kevin Lin left. Emmett Shear, uh, to me, is the technical founder of Twitch in the sense that like, he is a person who has greatly built, innovated, and improved on the content delivery network um, that 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 was actually, by the way, one of the main targets of um, Amazon's acquisition. A lot of people think that Amazon acquired Twitch because it was a um, platform that they wanted to expand into live streaming with, but Amazon has no incentive to do that. Amazon is not an ad platform, right? Google wanted to buy Twitch because of, of Twitch's power in advertising because Google has Google AdWords. But Amazon uh, Amazon's ad program is only internal. It's only for people that are uh, running stuff on Amazon products. They don't have an ad system that's developed like Google AdWords or Facebook or 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 um or uh, Microsoft and Bing. They they don't have that system. So Amazon didn't buy Twitch for the the, the potential of a lot. This is a big misunderstanding. Amazon didn't buy Twitch for the uh mis for the 
add potential or to expand into live stream? Why would they care? They they don't they don't have their their focus is products. Their focus is selling stuff on Amazon. That's what they do, and they're really good at it, and they make trillions of dollars off of it. So why did they, so, so why did Amazon buy Twitch? Right. Well, it's two reasons. One is because of Amazon Prime, and they see it and saw it as a viable means of getting people, young people, uh, young people to subscribe to Prime. That's why the last three to four years on the platform, pretty much every change you've seen is to encourage people towards Prime. That's why it's called Amazon Prime subs, right? Prime gifting. You have to have an Amazon Prime account to be able to, to, to gift Prime. They see it as a, as a way to get uh, people into their subscription service. Secondly, um, they saw the CDN, which is a content delivery network, basically the way that Twitch technologically delivers video to you, um, and it's uh, innovative and unique design. Going back to Emmett Shear, this is something that he pioneered with the help of a couple of other people. The engineers are kind of on the back end. I don't know if they want to be mentioned. I don't know if it's relevant to this video. If you don't believe me, Amazon used the content delivery network to actually build out its own product called IVS Amazon. A lot of people don't know about this either. Amazon Interactive Video Service is a live stream experience that actually allows you to create your own Twitch. And what is it based off of? It's literally based on Twitch. After this product came out, Amazon was basically done with that section of Twitch technologically. You can literally run your own Twitch, like cooking dot whatever, on Amazon's AWS services. And, and, and also, if you look at the structure of Twitch and where it actually sits in the Amazon ecosystem, it sits under AWS for this reason. It sits under um, a, a, a formerly Andy Jassy, who I guess is now becoming CEO. So this is important to understand because um, it's, it, it's, it's important to understand the reasons that Amazon bought Twitch because then you'll start to understand what kind of happened to the website and, and, and why it took the direction it did. After Amazon bought Twitch, Every single change to the website for the following four to five years was either to uh, make money, right, which is, a, which is the core driver of any co corporation, or to encourage people to do Amazon Prime. So what kind of changes did we see after Amazon um, uh, bought Twitch? Well, we saw Amazon Prime come out, um, led by my friend Ethan Evans, which is a f a f I think was a phenomenal update to the website, right? But was still like an, an effort to kind of monetize. We saw very, we saw Amazon watch parties, right? Which was just a connection to, um, uh, uh, to a subscription service, which surprise you need prime to have, right? Like, so, so on and on, like sub gifting bits, right? All this stuff was sort of monetization efforts or ways to encourage people to go to Amazon prime and internally in the company, the things that were getting approved to go forward were things that Amazon saw either as upsells to Prime, or uh, uh, i.e. the ability for people to kind of like uh, buy and um, more Prime subscriptions, or ways to make the website money. And throughout this entire process, the community aspect that made Twitch special started to get lost. Now, I think this, here comes the, a pretty hot take if you're ready for this. I think this was exacerbated by the introduction of IRL. Okay, so I remember a time where nobody on Twitch was even allowed to stream long gaming content. Your partner manager would actually come to you if you were a, a significant broadcaster. This happened to me, and they said, "Hey, like stream more gaming content. Like, there's a lot of stuff that's not gaming. Like, we're a gaming website." The introduction of IRL was an idea of a category at first on Twitch that now dominates about 12% of the total viewership hours of Twitch, but I would argue dominates about 90% of its culture. So IRL is the idea of doing stuff that's not video games. That's the easiest way to describe the IRL category. It might be wandering around. Uh, and there's some really cool stuff that comes out of IRL. And I've interacted with a lot of IRL content creators. But I also simultaneously believe that it started the downfall culturally of the website. I think that content on, and I realize this is a hot take, and I, I want to see the comments about this. And you know, you can you can come at me on Twitter or tell me what you think about this. But I really do think that the onboarding of IRL started this sort of degeneracy that we now see in 2022 as like just bad content a lot of really low effort reacts content a lot of really low effort like um like uh content that just is drama baiting and stuff like that kind of all came in with the introduction of irl before that the website was focused on gaming the website was focused on uh, on goal setting in gaming objectives in gaming or talking about gaming or building communities around gaming so you have to see that uh, that as the website is is uh devolving there are two separate things going on 
Emmett Shear, who was the technological founder, becomes CEO, right? Fails to lead the website because he never understood and doesn't understand to this day the importance of Twitch from a non technological standpoint. Emmett Shear, at his best, is a CTO. He is not a CEO. That is why a year ago I called for him to step down for a CEO that uh, would actually be able to understand community. The, the trouble there, and I actually got challenged by Twitch, Twitch executives privately on this, was that um, you can't do it. Who are you going to find? That how many people can successfully run a 5,000 person Silicon Valley company that have the knowledge to, to lead that company who have the both as an executive and understand the platform well enough to do that? Almost nobody, right? And, and then, like, when I was challenged, like, hey, can you think of anybody that can do this? I was like, no, I can't, right? Um, so Emmett Shear has kind of stayed in that position both because of necessity, but also kind of just this sort of like uh, head down, like, stubbornness. That, 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 that he thinks that nobody else can do it. And maybe he's right. You know, who knows? So becoming CEO, Emmett has had no pulse on the community. And I, I just do not think he is capable of understanding how um, communities interact. And we have so many numerous examples of this. Um, the awkward show at, like, at Glitch Cons and Twitch Cons and, and, and the presentations that he gives and just these sort of like corporate... Uh, dissonance that, that, that he has like stepping back we've never felt that like twitch has like a leader i would argue that that spiritual leader of twitch had always been marcus right dj weed before he left i think he was really the spokesperson of twitch and he tried several times to uh, to, to to speak to the community about twitch but like without any support at an executive level and with a ceo that just kind of like um rudderless when it comes to driving the, the direction of twitch uh, he, it's hopeless. It's just a battle he could not win. And eventually he kind of realized that. And I, and I think that was a, a key reason for his departure. So at an executive level, we've got this happening. We've got the Amazon stuff coming in because keep in mind, the Amazon thing is gradual. And then at a, um, at a uh, like real level, we've got the introduction of IRL, the introduction of React's content, the introduction of, of, of sort of low effort content farming and drama baiting, the rise of broadcasters who started to realize that they could, they could adopt audiences who were younger, who were um, less educated on things in gaming and uh, wanted to sort of focus on that like sort of IRL drama stuff, the rise of websites like live or of subreddits like Livestream Fail that despite having a million subscribers has an enormous cultural impact on Twitch. And uh, this whole kind of ecosystem started to develop where a new type of user who uh, was more interested in power using the website to find out what was going on. Like, um, <laughs> let me use a, an interesting example. Have you ever heard of a um, magazine called The Economist? It's a fantastic um, world news and political and economics and business magazine. Um, and then have you ever heard of, uh, what's those, what are those magazines that... I, I don't even know the name of them, like the, 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 the Hollywood Reporter or whatever, the ones that you uh, like, like go into a supermarket and you see like whoever is pregnant in the celebrity world. We moved from that, like a specialist magazine about gaming content and that to like more of like the celebrity type of thing. And that attracts a certain type of user. It's a user who is more parasocial, right? Which cause, which was a huge problem for particularly female uh, streamers, and but also everybody that's trying to stream. Um, it, it, a, a user who is kind of more obsessive and 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 just sort of less interested in sort of quality, high production content. Now, Twitch did maintain creators that still produce that kind of content, um, which was stuff like. Uh, uh, people like Germa, for example, right? Who, 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 and, and Ludwig up until he left for YouTube, who produced um, a lot of uh, like shows. Uh, Mizkif produced a lot of shows, right? But these streamers, even them, a large amount of their content still had to fit this new meta of reacting and of, uh, of just like just because that's the amount of hours you have on stream. It uh, it started to become by 2021. And nowadays, like to maintain a broadcast at the level that they do, you have to do that stuff, right? There's no choice. This is what Twitch has become. It's not like video where you, you could do that. So this sort of starts to paint the picture of what was happening to Twitch, right? And, and this is sort of the story that I don't think has ever been told in any kind of cohesive form. So Emmett Shear became increasingly um, just kind of solidified. And like people just didn't, like the people that really understood, like I think Aragon, who's the chief content officer, a person, I've, a person that I've met with many times, and I, and I just have appreciated his insight 
up until the the very end had a vision for Twitch that he just couldn't push through Emmett. Now, I'm not speaking on behalf of him. He never said that to me at all. Um, these are just things that I have inferred. He was very diplomatic and very, uh, and I think was a, a fan of Emmett at, at some level, right? Like I, he, he never spoke poorly about him. So I'm not trying to um, give you any kind of like personal insight from him himself. It's just my perception that it seemed like a lot of the executive staff at Twitch was repeatedly trying to bring Emmett and Amazon by proxy into this idea that Twitch was about the community. Now you had other people on Amazon's side who were also believed in that, like Ethan Evans. I mentioned him before. He's one of my closest friends and he's the person that invented Twitch Prime. He's also one of the people that invented um, uh, subgifting. He's he's responsible for most of those like initial big changes on Twitch that allowed a lot of creators to monetize. But he was also a fan of community. He ran a community on Twitch himself and was one of the very few executives at Twitch that actually streamed. Well, unbelievably, like look at the CEO of Twitch. How many times has he been on a live stream? He goes on once per year on a, on a well-produced show. The last time he streamed on his personal channel was eight years ago. And you know why? It was to test a function of the content delivery network. Emmett Shearer doesn't stream. N neither did any of the, uh, of, of the people. And you would think like, and you might say, well, of course, they're executives. Um, why would they do that? Well, every other person who was an executive in a social media platform uses their service, right? Susan at YouTube, who's the CEO of YouTube, has gone on with Moist Critical, has gone on with PewDiePie and significant content creators. Uh, Jack Dorsey used Twitter up until the time that he depart departed. He used his own platform all the time, right? You, you can find all these examples of a lot of these technological founders who are using their platforms, and yet none of the executives use their platform. So they didn't understand it, and they don't, right? Like, like you'd, be un you'd be unbelievably surprised how few Twitch employees stream. It's, it's crazy, right? Out of the 5,000 people that stream, uh, sorry, 5,000 people that work at Twitch, right? Very few of them broadcast on a regular basis. And, and, and that is a huge reason why the website started to um, decline. Now, simultaneously, you've got what's going on, what's, what Marcus is saying. You're hiring people that are sort of out of spec with the gaming world. You're hiring the typicals from Amazon. You're hiring the typicals from Facebook. You're hiring the typicals from Silicon Valley, right? And like, let me tell you, without getting into a whole other tangent, or try, I'll try really hard to not do a Devin Nash tangent on this, but man, when you start hiring from Silicon Valley, that is a particular and peculiar group of employees who believe a certain, uh, in a certain direction for the world uh, that will drastically change your culture if you are not careful. Um, if I see a resume from a person from a traditional fan company, uh, I throw that stuff out as fast as possible <laughs> because I, I, I am terrified of the uh, dynamic of culture that gets introduced with that. And I am not going to say anything else because I don't want to get canceled. So that's it. Um, but j suffice to say that that changed this company drastically. And I think uh, for any of these sort of uh, in and the knowers at, in the Twitch community, you only need to look at like how Trust and Safety has handled the bans and the uh, to, to know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll leave you all to comment on that, okay? Because I've got nothing else to say on that or I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get a lot of angry texts, okay? So, <laughs> so there you go. It changed a lot. So um, Twitch has been hiring at a pretty incredible rate as well. So Twitch hired more than 500 people last year, right? Which is uh, just about nine people a week and has hired even more than that to get themselves up to um, the numbers that they have now. Uh, and uh, when you hire people that fast, it's uh, very difficult, right, to keep your culture. So you, are, you have a niche website that's trying to become uh, an entertainment platform for all live streaming, right? Um, but I think if you look back at the vision of like Justin Kahn and the original founders of Twitch like Kevin Lin, they understood the importance of a gaming website and, and, and the niche that that entailed. Emmett Shear didn't understand that purpose. And he saw Twitch as a global entertainment platform that would dominate all live streaming, but Twitch was never meant to do that. And, and, and I would argue that live streaming as a service was never meant to support that, right? It's not like YouTube where I can upload this video, um, which is going to take me, you know, because I make incredibly long videos, uh, this is going to take me, what, 30, 40 minutes? And by the way, this is a one-shot. I don't edit, man. I just, like, I go, 
And then I literally click the MP4 and I upload it to YouTube, and there it is. The, th the thing that takes the most time for these videos is the thumbnail. So I, I that's I do a lot of prep on some videos, but this one's just ad hoc. I'm just going right. And it's one of the reasons why I ramble. You know, everyone's like, make shorter videos, make four to ten minute. You know what? No, we're gonna get really deep into subjects. We're gonna do it like nobody else does it. Okay, so that's why these videos are so long, and they ramble sometimes. They go different directions. So so Emmett. Okay, back to that. <laughs> um. Declined to comment. Of course he did. Okay. Anyway, where are we talking about? So we're talking about the like like seen as a whole entertainment platform. Twitch was never meant to be that. Twitch was meant to be a gaming platform, and live streaming itself can't support that. This video takes what 30, 40 minutes, and then I'm back to my day. I'm back at working my agency. I'm back at um doing the stuff that I do. Right. Uh, I go play some Pathfest. Do whatever I want. Right. Cool. Twitch isn't like that. Twitch, you got to stream. Look at the top broadcasters on Twitch. They're streaming 150 hours, 200 hours, 200 hours a month because they have no choice to do it. They're, they're putting in 60 to 70 hour work weeks, 10 hours a day because they have to keep that content engine going. That's the nature of live streaming. So by that virtue, live streaming can't support the vast majority of industries. It can't support like a, a person that just wants to be a chef or wants, or something like that. They just can't do those kind of hours. If you have any sort of like business or kind of thing that you're trying to do in the real world. Like as soon as I got into esports, I had no time to stream. There was no way, right? I'm running a, a company of over a hundred people. I can't do it. There's just no time. So, but, but even if you you have like a full-time job doing something else, unless you can, you're one of the few people that can integrate that live stream into their content. Um, like some of the funny stuff we saw with some of the people that were doing, uh, 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 like, uh, like those streams with like the gas station, they work at a gas station or something. That's like very rare, right? Like you have to have like permission and you, you get all these problems with filming people publicly. There's all these, all these issues. You can't do it. Now contrast that to a service like TikTok Live that's come up in recent months. And you see that like TikTok streams are far more casual. That people show up, they get supported and they don't like really build communities in the same way. So Twitch was a gaming website. Justin Kahn saw that vision, right? Kevin Lynn saw that vision. John Howell saw that vision. But, um, but I, I think the, the sort of new guard of, of Twitch wanted to become this entertainment platform that it was never meant to be. And as a result, it lost its way. It's lost its community. It, it, it lost the relationship between the company and streamers that helped spawn its most lasting innovations, right? The first mainstream creator economy. That is why we love Twitch. We love Twitch because Twitch was a gaming platform where we could go and we could talk to like-minded people. We felt like those, those people were like us, right? Men and women who were passionate about gaming. Men and women that were passionate about something that uh, for the longest time was not regarded as cool, was regarded as a waste of time. How many people in, in, in my age group had parents that were like, you're wasting your time playing video games. You're never going to go anywhere. And now you can say, no, mom and dad, I'm going to be an eSports pro. I'm going to League of Legends. I'm going to the LCS, baby. Become a millionaire. Now you, now you can say that. You're probably not going to be able to do it, but you can probably say it, okay? It's a thing. You can prove to use cases people that have made their careers off of gaming. I would not be here today without Twitch. I would not be a person that, 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 that sold a company um, uh, that, that, to, to, to Madison Square Garden and then started another company that will be even bigger because uh, we built it off of the uh, off of Twitch and now we've expanded. But man, like it, like like so much opportunity and so many careers have been built on this website. Twitch doesn't understand that its power was in empowering gamers to be more than they could ever be. That, that, that to, to be more than communities ever and, and parents and people and the mainstream thought that they ever could be. The mainstream was the enemy. They were the enemy because they didn't believe in gaming. And, tw and the, the, the executives at Twitch, like Emmett Shear, they wanted to make Twitch into that mainstream thing. Why? Because they wanted to be bigger and to make more money. Because they wanted it to be something that it was not. And they wanted to expand, expand, expand until they thought that, and they thought they could dominate the entirety of the live stream market, but they reached too far. And TikTok overcame them on the IRL section overnight. When TikTok came out a couple of months ago, already the, you, you see people streaming in uh, airplanes there. You see all kinds of stuff that's IRL, people building businesses and selling it there. It's much more native to that kind of platform um, and, and to that kind of attention gathering because Twitch was a website made to watch people play games. And I think the introduction of a lot of these things was uh, the, the things that made it decline. So. We can talk about esports and kind of how that integrated. I, I don't think it's important for this video. Um, I thought that esports uh, at one time 
I, I think during like 2015 to 2016, when uh, my previous company, Catawagic Gaming, had a contract with Twitch, we were being paid by Twitch, uh, 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 along with most of the other esports teams, to uh, basically have all of our streamers, uh, all of our influencers on Twitch, and all of our pro players. And simultaneously, uh, Twitch itself was supporting the esports industry. Now, it stopped doing that. It was financially supporting the esports industry. It was a big reason why esports got off the ground. A lot of people don't tell that story either, right? I, t I promised you that I'd tell you a lot of stuff that I don't think people know in one video, and, and here it is. Uh, Twitch was the main reason why esports got off the ground. They financially supported most of the major esports teams you see in the LCS or in CSGO uh, um, financially, like literally gave us money. And they did that because they believed in esports. And, it, and at the time in 2015, esports. Uh, dominated 25% of the live viewership of the platform. It was a big deal, right? You had, you had everything from Smash and like Evo, um, Frostbite, and then you had the LCS and League of Legends, which was dominating every week. You had CSGO there, you had ESL, you had, um, you had Face It, you had everything on, on, on there. Now, the, now the, a lot of those guys have taken platform deals other places, like now they, they, they stream on Facebook or, or, or YouTube to like lower viewership. And Twitch has lost that esports field because it stopped financially supporting it. Amazon didn't see the vehicle. Right when Amazon acquired the company, Amazon didn't see the the vehicle of esports as a way to direct people to Amazon Prime, and because it wasn't really relevant to the content delivery network, they axed it and they stopped financially supporting esports. And that's why you see that the only successful content creation teams that have uh, that have risen in, in the past few years have been teams that have built their own content networks off of what, off of what, off of YouTube. Right, the predominant influencers at 100 Thieves are YouTube influencers. Valkyrie, Courage, JD. Right, the predominant influencers at places like um, uh, 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 at Face Clan are YouTubers. Right, they were that was how they had to segue. Twitch lost its way in terms of supporting esports and in terms of supporting individual influencers and paying them. We also saw this in things that have happened recently with how uh, Amazon and Twitch has turned direction from supporting its largest content creators. Amazon. Uh, was get didn't want to get into the platform war of um, understandably of fighting YouTube and and, and previously Mixer um, and now uh, Facebook for paying streamers to stay on the platform. So you started to see a lot of these sort of big creators leave. And I um I I just think that that sort of turn away that focus into IRL content that turn away from esports and that sim and simultaneously just all these factors going on you can kind of start to see why Twitch as a website started to really decline to its core community um and I I, I really like to some of this stuff that that was highlighted it says Veteran employees chafed against the new the notion that newcomers could directly apply marketing or business expertise. Um, I, I I'd stand in meetings. I really want to try to forget everything you know about like Twitter. Twitch is not Twitter, not Facebook, not Pandora. Twitch is its own thing and incredibly magical, right? Absolutely right. You can see like these veteran employees trying to hold on to like what they originally believed in. Um, but these people just gradually let go. Another big thing too was um, so in 2020, co-founder Kevin Lynn retired. So Kevin. Uh, I, I need to be careful how much I say about this, uh, but I think it was pretty obvious that Kevin, along with most of the people in uh, Twitch at the time, was just coming up on the three to four year um, vesting schedule. So when a company buys another company, what, sorry, when a lot, this is kind of some cool MA stuff that I like to talk about. When a large company buys another company, typically they will want the key executives in that company to stay on for some amount of time. So they will either make them an offer or they will make the sale of the company like itself contingent on those executives staying the course with that company. And the way they will reward those executives is with a vesting schedule of parent stock, meaning that for two to four years usually, they will pay the employee an impressive salary, but also stock units of the original company. So when I sold um, CLG to Madison Square Garden, I was offered a contract where I would earn stock in Madison Square Garden if I stayed on for a certain period of time. Now, I ended up refusing that contract because I kind of saw the direction esports was going. I wanted to go into the influencing world. Um, other people, like my business partner, George, uh, accepted that contract, right? And then stayed with CLG to this day. But uh, I just didn't uh, want to do it. You know, I, I have a lot of reasons for that that nobody probably cares about, so I'm not going to get into it. But um, those executives at Twitch were offered the same deal. And around the time of 2020, you started to see a lot of those executives depart 
because um, naturally those those vesting schedules came to an end. And and quite frankly, in a in a billion dollar sale, every one of those executives for the amount of equity they held was donezo. I mean, like I mean, like done for the rest of your life, done. Right. So it's understandable that. Just by virtue of that, those guys pieced out. Now, there's no um, fault here. There's no like real thing to say. This is just a part of acquisitions. What, a, a, your, your key executives are eventually going to leave. And this is a big reason why a lot of companies that get acquired by larger companies stall out and just kind of don't go anywhere. Because after the vesting schedule for those employees is through, those people just peace out. They leave, and that's the that's the end of it. And it's real hard to get that vision back because if you don't have key leadership um, that stays, they uh, you just you just kind of lose the way. Now Emmett Shear has survived his vesting schedule, rescheduled different vesting schedules, and keeps going. Has more money than God, and somehow stays in as CEO. I have no idea why. <laughs> don't ask me. Uh, particularly when he just seems so disinterested in the direction of the company. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many former Twitch employees would tell me that they would go into meetings with him with these like carefully prepared uh, presentations and everything. He'd just be playing Hearthstone on a tablet. And just kind of like nod his head, just completely disconnected, right? Like he just has no business being CEO. And uh, I don't understand it. A little bit here about sort of Twitch do better. So this was kind of uh, the, this is like 2019-ish, 2020-ish is like when Twitch is starting to have all of these problems with trust and safety. So Sarah Clemens, the chief operating officer, was a big part, now departed, was a very big part of um, initiating kind of all of these sort of trust and safety drama, the ban stuff, uh, sort of trying to tighten Twitch up as an entertainment platform to be more friendly to advertisers. Now she was being pressured heavily by Amazon to do that. And um, I, uh, but, but, but also that was, I think, well within her vision. And um, although I think Sarah was a, uh, is an, and was a fair executive, I'm not like, just as a personal opinion, I don't think that she was really a really great fit for Twitch, which again, I think was like, I, I think she was part of that, um, that that group of people that, that that couldn't see Twitch as like a the gaming niche website that it was meant to be. Um, then you had the chief content officer, the person that was responsible for like content direction, Aragorn. I think he did see it, um, but just like lacked the power to be able to like really influence like the sort of bigger heads at Amazon and and, and Sarah and Emmett in that direction. So Sarah actually implemented a lot of the um, changes that you saw to trust and safety. And she was responsible for a lot of the sort of disconnect between the community and the um, streamers when a lot of like bans were being handed out for like no reason. There was some favoritism being played on the side of Twitch. This was just a, 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 a whole kind of uh, historical direction that, that, that it took as a result of like Sarah's just kind of influence now. And, and obviously, like when I'm talking about a leader like this, she's one aspect of many, many hundreds of people that are working under her, right? Like, like, like these people are not exclusively uh, responsible, nor should they be held like entirely accountable or uh, for, for like what happened, right? Like it's really hard to be a leader. It's really hard to be an executive. And um, it's particularly hard if, if, if you don't, if you come from a world like Sarah did of like corporations that just were too big and, and, and the vision of them was different. They were like huge platforms, right? Um, they, they, they weren't like a, a niche thing. So, 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 so a lot of people didn't see that kind of value at Twitch that, that, that had been from this gaming niche and that caused it right over time to just start getting all of these really, um, strange and, and, and just bad, uh, changes to Twitch, which started like, like, and all this, all this stuff, like we can talk about it forever. Um, but this is where, like, the I would say this is where the public really saw Twitch start to decline. They they start you, you started to see threads on Reddit every day about some dumb thing that happened to their favorite streamer. You would see no Twitch employees talking to any of those streamers, and you would, I guess, most importantly, see no communication from Twitch on these issues because twitch again took this like, like a lot of people wonder in that era and now why twitch like doesn't make public statements about um individual streamers like if hassan abi gets banned or soda poppin or something why doesn't twitch like make community posts or like try to talk to the community about that kind of stuff it's because they see themselves as bigger than it 
You, you, you see? Like, they see themselves, it's because of everything we've talked about. The, 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 the big heads there, they see themselves as an entertainment platform. As a, as a platform, they don't, they don't need to focus on an individual streamer like why XQC got banned. It's not important to them, right? They're like, again, it shows this, this um, disconnect like, oh, it, it's not our community. These are our users. There's a huge difference, right? These are, these, are, like, th these are our users. These are people that use our website, right? They're, like, they're not our community that like, interact and pay and, and, and support us. Like, you have to understand like, Twitch isn't Amazon. Amazon, I go to Amazon and buy stuff. I order a pair of scissors overnight because I need a pair of scissors. I go to Twitch because I believe in the community. Like, it's so, blows my mind and it's so frustrating as a person that's so passionate about Twitch and, 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 and gaming. I feel like a madman when I say this, that like, I can't believe that Twitch executives and, and the highest and most important people at Twitch never understood this. That if you are going to Twitch, you aren't going there as a user of some tech platform. You're going there to be a part of a community uh, and, and, and to be a, a small part of like a chat and a group of people that know, like, and trust you. You're going because you have an influencer that you really are impressed by or um, that you believe in or because you have friends there or whatever. And like what Twitch did was it disconnected itself from the community by labeling them as users. But man, they aren't your users. They're your community because those are the people that are giving you money straight up. They're giving you directly money based on their degree of belief in the support they're giving to influencers. They subscribe. They, t they, they give bits. They, not because of Twitch as a platform because they need to buy products from it or because they want the, the, the latest iPhone. It's because they believe in the people that are running it. So your core on Twitch is and always will be your content creators. And that is what, the, what they left behind for the vision of this tech company that's an entertainment platform, this, this, this huge uh, vision that was unaccomplishable by a platform like Twitch. And they never understood that. And so that was his downfall. And that, that, that is going to continue to be its downfall. And I think that is the reason why every, I just wanted to like make this video that summarizes why everybody feels this way about Twitch and what happened to lead us to this point. Twitch was, all, and what happened to lead me to this point, <laughs> right? Like, like, like I have to talk about this because I'm so frustrated that I have to make videos like this I'm one of the people that love, like, genuinely love Twitch, right? Like, I made these videos and I was sad. I was really sad to see over sexualization come to Twitch in a huge way. I was really sad to see gambling come to Twitch and be completely ignored. I was really sad to see dog shit react content come to Twitch and be championed, right? And unlike YouTube, which was big enough to absorb that hit and kind of throw those people into a um, category, uh, Twitch became dominated by it and became all about the latest streamer drama and everything that was happening. I remember when Twitch was a website about people who everyone thought was not cool, that we could go do our own thing and everybody could, uh, and everybody could be a part of it. Like, I remember when Twitch was a website where you would go to watch awesome gameplay and you would go to support somebody that you believed in that was trying to become like a full-time pro player or like a full-time content creator. And there's still that aspect of Twitch. Like, despite all of this stuff that has worked against it and, and, and literally every effort of the top executives at Twitch to, to, to destroy this, Twitch still maintains that gaming core. And I still love watching little streams on there 500 viewer streams or less that are about Path of Exile or Elden Ring or something. Um, and Twitch still maintains that sort of meta core and some of the OGs, but I just wonder for how long. And, and, and for new people, it's become so difficult to become a content creator on Twitch, if not impossible, because Twitch has made it so inaccessible for new creators to do anything because they are monetizing the top they are, they, are, they are showing ads and pushing product and pushing resources into the website that make Twitch more money, but don't focus on content creators. So, of course, content creators have no discovery systems, which should have been built on, YouTube, on Twitch like they were on YouTube eight years ago. 
We should have had search. We should have had tags. We should have had stuff that allowed people to find people. Jesus, why Why is it that if I make a stream in a category like Elden Ring or something, and I'm number 400 stream, I'm undiscoverable, right? Like, why is there nothing that defines me as unique on Twitch besides the game I'm playing? It's because Twitch focused on monetization features. Twitch focused on features that made the website more money and made more people subscribe for Amazon Prime and made Amazon more money and made Twitch a more of like an entertainment platform rather than focusing on the creators that are the lifeblood, the essence of your website. The essence of your website. The very core of it. So, despite all of that, Twitch has to this day limped on. And it will. But it will gradually fade like a star and one day be irrelevant to platforms that understand the concept of focusing on, uh, on, on their core, right? And eventually there will be a community that supports Twitch, uh, supports what Twitch was better. I don't know when that is, um, but short of a drastic change in executive direction, I, I, I don't see it happening. And if I could convey one emotion to you as a result of all this history that I hope you're now kind of as caught up as I am uh, on, on like what really happened, uh, it's sadness because I actually truly love this website, not only for what it enabled in my life, but also for what was to and is to so many people. I don't want to see it fail. It really frustrates me. Um, my life is really different now that I stopped streaming. Uh, I used to stream every day, and I really still like hang out with that community like all the time on Discord. But I can't live stream there anymore. It's not the same. It's 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 just what's this and this thing about this stupid streamer drama thing or what this person said or why this person got banned. It's so dumb, man. It, it, it it's it's banal shit that we should be beyond. It's the very core, like Twitch, guess what? You succeeded in becoming an entertainment platform. Now you're just like every other social media website that espouses tons of bad feelings, leads people to become depressed, forces people into parasocial infrastructure and relationships that don't benefit them, and isn't about anything. It's just, it, it, it's just a talking box where people echo negativity and bad shit. And there's still some OGs on the platform holding out. You guys that are like the OG gamers or just trying to run a good show, I salute you, man. I truly do. And I support you. Like, that's why I still try to create videos about content creation and how to succeed. Like, if you're still trying to make that happen, like, I, I believe in there's so many people from my close friends um, who are kind of seeing this decline. I know you're as disappointed as I am. And, um, I, I, I just, I just, am, I'm so grateful for you all. And I hope you still stream and do this, but I can't do it anymore. You know, I, I can't, I can't go to that meta. So all I can do is talk about it and get people more aware. Um, but I'm grateful for those OGs that keep the website real. So that's what happened to Twitch. That's its history. And I hope that uh, this has been beneficial to you. Um, I, I talk about this stuff all the time. So subscribe to the channel if you liked it. Also, uh, I have a Discord, discord.gg slash discord.gg slash Devin. It's in the link down below. And you'll also find my Patreon, patreon.com slash Devin Nash. That basically just pays for like research videos and stuff that we do. If you want to support that, um, I also do videos on there. So this is the history of Twitch. That's what happened. And I'm really glad that Cecilia made this article because it allowed us to talk about it. I hope you really enjoyed this video. Um, or even if you didn't, leave me a comment either way and uh, I'd be happy to read it. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.